Gentlemen, the subject that I've chosen is the forgotten art of healing. The great advances of technology and science have completely changed the face of medicine. Medicine can perform marvelous feats which were thought impossible when I first started medical work 60, 70, 80 years ago. But there is a strange paradox here. There is an increasing distrust, disillusionment, and even antagonism to medicine and to medical professionals. For example, in Bombay, if a patient dies, sometimes he's, the nurse is beaten up or the doctor is beaten up, or the nursing home is vandalized, sometimes even set on fire. This is a double paradox, really, if you ask me. Why should this be so? For example, Many, many years ago, when I started work, when science and technology were hovering in the background and medicine had not achieved much at all, the profession, the standard of the profession and the respect for the profession was great. And the image of the doctor was next to none. And today, when medicine has achieved so much, has given us much, a remarkable increase in the longevity of individuals, of Indians as well. When science holds medicine in a real tight embrace, what do you see? The respect for the profession is not as great. And the image of the physician has plummeted. Why is this so? This is because I feel that medicine, in a way, has strayed from its paths. The mechanization of medicine and the hubris of its science and technology have submerged its art, robbed it of its raison d'etre is humanity. The physician no longer ministers to a distinctive individual. He tenders only to malfunctioning different organ systems. The patient is himself forgotten. Physician doesn't realize that the malfunctionings are organs are within the patient and do not stand by themselves. The patient, as I said, is in the background and is often unnoticed and forgotten. Now, the burgeoning advance of science and technology has made both the doctor the physician, the students also, be more concerned with the current advances in the technological aspects of medicine. But medicine is learned at the bedside. It is taught at the bedside. It is learned by listening to the patient, talking to the patient, touching the patient, examining the patient not just from books, not just from gleaming machines, sophisticated gadgetry, not from the rapturous enjoyment, if I may say so, of lovely images produced by CTs, MRIs, endoscopies, angiographies, and the other fruits of modern medicine. Make no mistake. I am not decrying science. It is science, really speaking, which has allowed medicine to take a quantum leap into this century and will continue to do so for many centuries to come. 
But there are many aspects to medicine than science and technology. Medicine is not just science and technology. Technology can't take a proper history. Technology cannot perform a proper physical examination. Technology cannot help a poor patient suffering from a serious disease, taking away his anxiety, his worries. Nor can technology soothe the anxiety and the anguish of relatives of such a patient. It is often forgotten that medicine is as much an art as a science. What is the art of medicine? It is very difficult to describe in words what the art of medicine is. It has no physical attributes. You cannot quantify it as you can quantify other sciences. I think it is, how shall I put it? abstract getting together of qualities of both the mind and the heart which help to look after the patient to the best possible extent. If you were to ask me, yes, if you were to ask me to, what exa can you put the art of medicine down in a single word? I would say it is humanity. But unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, the art of medicine is now in the shadows. It has been overwhelmed by the advances of science of medicine. But it is an art which needs to be resuscitated. If lost, for example, it is forgotten now, but if lost, it would be sad for both man and medicine. There was a great uh, physician in the Renaissance, a bit of an eccentric physician. His name was Paracelsus. And I was always struck by what he said. I always try to remember it. I hope I do so now. He said that the physician must develop the feel and the touch so that it makes him possible to be in sympathetic communion with the patient's spirit. Remarkable, isn't it? It just, this epitomizes the remarkable thoughts in the heart of medicine. So how do you start, how do you, how do, you do that? How do you become in sympathetic communication with the patient's spirit? I think the first thing is to listen taking a history of the patient. Now, unfortunately, the art of history taking also is a lost art. To my mind, it is impossible to be perfect at the art of history taking, even if you had a lifetime or two lifetimes doing that. Why is this so? Because the disease is never the same in different patients. It manifests differently in different patients. Each patient is unique and manifests the disease perhaps in a different way. The manifestation of a disease just not dependent on the disease itself. It depends upon the changes produced in the body within by the disease. It then depends upon the physiological adaptation to those changes that takes place. That again, that again is not the same in every patient. It depends on the constitution of the patient, on the endurance of the patient, on the environment of the patient, and also on the genetics of the patient Genetics, which has come so much into vogue in today's time. 
also. A patient might describe his symptom in one way and another might in another way. A patient with a heart attack might say, I have pain in the chest. And another patient with a heart, milk, heart attack might say, I have acute indentation. A patient with a pain in the shoulder will go to the orthopedic person, whereas really the patient has had a problem with his heart. So each patient with the same disease may express themselves differently. And that is a difficult problem for the doctor. To separate the chaff from the grain, the relevant from the irrelevant, is indeed difficult. But if a physician can do so, he will have probably quite understood what is likely the matter with the patient. Students always ask me, how does, wh what is the secret of taking a good history? The secret of taking a good history is listening to the patient. Listening with every faculty, the senses of your body. Then only a good physician might be able to feel or hear a problem which has not been told to him. It is extremely important not only to let him talk about his physical problems. Whilst he's talking, to, you must have an idea as to his mental state. It's so important. Because it's sometimes the mind which is responsible for symptoms which mimic disease. And it is the mind which often colors the disease. And a good physician should be able to realize that and recognize that. Nowadays, even a student doesn't bother to take a personal history, the family history, the social history, the marital history. All this is very important. Sometimes the clue to a problem lies in these, and they're completely abysmally forgotten. Well, after listening to the patient, you have to question the patient, and that is important. There are patients who just wish to please the doctor, so they say yes to everything.